just going to do for the next for the next 20 minutes or so is just sort of take you through um choking mostly the focus is is, is around choking although um very happy to talk about suffocation um you know and when we get to the end and the questions um at the end but the the focus of the presentation is is looking at um choking and airway obstruction particularly in kids um we'll talk a little bit about um you know just sort of the the, the background to it um you know in terms of what actually happens and, and why kids in particular are more predisposed to it um we'll talk a little bit around um you know the the, the treatment and um, that's primarily what we're focusing on um is how to treat an airway obstruction uh, a little bit around um, CPR, um, just sort of to, you know, as, as CPR and performing CPR as part of the management of any way obstruction, but also as a, as a refresh, just because it's so important. And um, then talk a little bit about prevention. And uh, so I think it'll take me about, uh, you know, 20 minutes-ish, and um, then there's uh, plenty of time for questions at the end of that. Um, so again, just because my normal PowerPoint tools don't work through Zoom. Uh, hopefully I won't embarrass myself um, by going backwards and forwards too much, but uh, hopefully we may go forward. Um, so just sort of professionally, um, I've got, you know, no conflicts or, dis or disclosures. I don't, you know, um, work for any manufacturers of any devices that have been made and sold to try and um, to clear airways or anything like that. As, um, you know, I've been introduced, you know, I work half-time for uh, Te Whata Ora here in Hawke's Bay and half-time for uh, Hatai Honu. Uh, St John um, in a national role. Um, so my background is as an emergency physician and obviously within, um, you know, within St John, um, you know, the work that I do involves, um, you know, uh, looking at paramedic practice, helping the paramedics, um, you know, education and clinical governance, that, that's sort of my role with, within St John. Um, a lot of you will be very familiar with with St John, but just um, broadly, just in terms of you know of who we are and what we do, um, we look after um, 4.2 million people spread over the country, and um, we provide um, the emergency ambulance response to about 92% of the, the population. So those of you in Wellington will know that they have uh, their own uh, unique boutique ambulance service, as I like to refer to it, um, Wellington Free, and Wellington Free um, Ambulance covers uh, the Wellington area and, and the wire wrapper. Um, and we work in a mixture of environments. We have, you know, obviously the, the urban environment, but, you know, a lot of a lot of our work is in rural areas, and we see the, the mix of problems that you'd see across those areas. So certain things are common to all environments, and certain things happen more commonly in urban areas than rural areas. Um, we have approximately um, 3,500 staff um, actively involved in ambulance response. We have um, 400 vehicles um, on the road, and we respond to approximately half a million um, emergency, emergency responses um, annually. So that's just to set the scene for St John. I'm sure um, many, if not most, of you are broadly familiar with with the national, you know, with the ambulance service and, and sort of how it works. So um, onto the, the the topic um, at hand, um, and you know the what is choking so so at, at its at its bare bones you know choking is where um air can't get in because there's a mechanical blockage um blocking the the windpipe at the top um you know the picture on the right there is just a really sim simple um anatomical drawing um that just shows the top part of the airway so you know air comes in through the nose and the mouth comes down into the the, the oropharynx um sort of the, the back of the mouth the back of the nose area um and then um the air travels down um the front um, through the, the passageway in the front, referred to known as the trachea. Um, over the top of the trachea sits the larynx, um, which has the vocal cords in it. And um, sitting immediately behind the trachea um, is the pipe, the, the, the gullet, the esophagus, which takes the food um, from the mouth to the stomach. So we've got two conflicting processes um, going on um, in the top of the airway. We've got one, which is where you, you've chewed some food or you've taken some fluid, and you have to get that food or fluid from the mouth um, into the gullet so that it goes down into the stomach. Um, and we've also got um, air that we're breathing in um, that we don't want to go to the stomach, we want to go down to the lungs. So um, the body has, uh, you know, has has developed um, a system where the epiglottis, um, which is a, a big fold of tissue, which sits at the top, um, when we're swallowing, the epiglottis drops down um, over the larynx, um, so the entrance to the trachea, um, and stops any food or food boluses um, uh, or liquids um, getting into the trachea. So they, they go past the, the, the larynx and down the back um, into the esophagus when we swallow. Um, and the process works well 
um, most of the time. Um, occasionally, um, what happens is that the food isn't so well chewed, so when it's swallowed, um, it doesn't smoothly go down the esophagus and it ends up sitting in the area that's labelled on the picture, the hypopharynx. So sitting um, over the, the junction between the esophagus um, and, the, and uh, the larynx and the trachea on the front. And what it can do is it can result in a blockage um, of the trachea. So the food doesn't go down the esophagus, it just sort of sits there. Um, when I say food, it, it can be anything. We'll come to that um, in a sec. But most commonly in New Zealand, what we deal with from a, a choking or airway obstructive airway obstruction point of view is food. Um, the, the, the blockage, the foreign body just sits there and the air can't get past it because the air can't get past it. Suddenly the patient um, becomes aware that the, whether it's the child, whether it's an adult, they become aware that they can't breathe because they've got a lump in their throat. Um, and that brings us to the, the sort of the universal sign of or sign of, that we see of choking, which is people clutching their throat. You know, that, that you know, if you, 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 you have ever been unfortunate enough to see anyone with an airway obstruction, you know, it's common, you know, that they're, they're trying to convey um, that they can't breathe um, because there's something um, blocking the trachea at the front. Um, we break it down into, into two different um, types of obstruction. A partial obstruction, where the, the person can still move some air around the blockage. So there's a blockage there, and they may feel like they're choking, but if you can calm them down and they breathe slowly, they can still get air around the obstruction. Um, and they can still get enough air in to, to stay conscious and to, you know, for oxygen to get into the bloodstream and to get to their brain. And then we have full obstruction, which is where there's no air being moved at all. Um, so these are the people that are, uh, uh, have a complete airway obstruction and, and are, are choking, they're not getting oxygen. And if we don't act in this, that group relatively quickly, um, potentially um, bad things are going to happen. Just in terms of some sort of facts around choking in New Zealand. Um, so. It waxes and wanes, it varies from day to day, but uh, St John goes to about a, a, you know, up to a dozen choking patients per day. Um, some days it's, it's considerably less, some days it's considerably more. And the good news is, um, in that regard, is that most have self-cleared the obstruction or they've cleared it with help by the time we get there. So 80% of people that we go to who are choking um, are no longer choking when we get there. So they've cleared cleared the obstruction, um, which, is, um, which is really good. Um, there's a couple of deaths a year in New Zealand. Some years, the, you know, again, you know, it's statistics, isn't it? Some years there's no deaths, other years there's small clusters, um, but it averages out to about one to two deaths um, in kids per year um, from choking, and most of them are um, under five years of age. Um, the bulk is is due to food, as we're alluding to, 50 to 60% of, um, of choking episodes are, are due to food, and that percentage increases with age. So most adults that we see who choke, um, they've choked, choked on food. Um, and sausages, um, hard meats, um, hard fruit or vegetables are the most common um, things that we see that people have, have choked on. Um, but as you go down in age, um, it's the, the incidence of the choking being due to something other than food increases, largely because we've got little kids who just put um, all sorts of things in their mouths. And it can be parts of toys, it can be button batteries, it's pretty much anything that is small enough to be put in the mouth potentially can be a choking hazard. Um, and of choking that we see in children, when we actually look at the numbers, 90% um, of the choking is, is less than um, four years. The, kid, the kids are less than four. So it's predominantly a clinical problem that is affecting um, smaller kids. And I think, you know, most people in, involved in, in this in this web who we would, you know, would be broadly aware of that. Um, and why it's the smaller kids? Well, it can be the smaller kids because, um, you know, they're more likely to swallow something without adequately chewing. They haven't quite got in sync um, you know, the, the sort of the, the psychomotor skills um, to, to know that, you know, you have to have chewed, um, you know, food to a certain consistency before you swallow. So they're more likely to have um, a large amount of food in their mouth. They're almost, they're, they're likely to not have chewed it to the, to the correct degree and they're more likely to swallow it um, prematurely. Um, and also important to this is the fact that the airway anatomy is is different, obviously, to adults. It's, it's smaller, um, but... Um, just because of the physics of how air flows through tubes, um, the fact that it's, it's smaller than an adult results in a significantly increase, an increase in the, um, sorry, well, I have to word this correctly. So um, as, as you, um, you know, the, the, the physical laws basically say that when you reduce the diameter of a tube, the flow of air through that tube drops off. And the smaller it gets proportionally, the flow drops off more significantly. So um, 
in kids with a smaller um, a smaller trachea um, and a smaller laryngeal opening, um, the reduction in flow compared to an adult is much greater. Hence, um, they they only need a small amount of food bolus to cause a much more significant obstruction. Sorry, that was a slightly long winded way of trying to say that. So coming back to um, the, the two different types of obstruction, so the partial obstruction or the complete obstruction. Um, so the partial obstruction is where the foreign body, um, again, usually food, but can be other things, depending on, um, particularly in young kids, what they've put in their mouths. Um, the foreign body is only partially blocking the larynx. And the, the classic presentation for that is um, the, you know, is, is, is panic. That, that's often the first thing that you see is that, um, you know, the adult or the child is absolutely panicked because they now have um, this um, sensation that they can't breathe and that they can't get air in. Um, so, you know, they can present as agitated, they can present as um, as anxious, they can progress as slightly, as slightly aggressive because they're just starting to get this overwhelming sense of panic that they can't breathe. Um, they may be coughing, they may have striderous noises depending on the degree of obstruction and where the foreign body is sitting. Um, you should be able to detect um, that there's some movement of air, so there's some breath coming in and out through through their mouth or nose, um, but their breathing can be laboured, it can be graspy, it can be um, quite noisy, um, again, depending on what the foreign body is and um, where it's sitting. Um, then we have full um, obstruction. So this is where the foreign body is completely blocking the larynx. Um, or it's actually passed through the larynx and it's in the trachea and it's sitting within the trachea completely blocking flow. And um, these are, you know, this is these are patients who will often present, as we've uh, I've already alluded to, with the universal sign of choking, you know, clutching their throat, you know, and they will also have um, the overwhelming sense of panic, but it'll be a degree worse because the, obviously the partial obstruction can move a little bit of air. Um, you know, the, these kids or adults are moving no air and um, the, the sense of panic um, rises very, very quickly. Um, they'll be trying to breathe. So um, depending how much of them you can see, you can see the muscles in the neck or the muscles in the chest working really hard, um, but they will be unable to cough. They'll be unable to speak. They'll be unable to breathe. Um, and you won't be able to calm them down and get breaths in because the, the obstruction is complete. Um, and this is this is a group that you need to think of any time that you find a child who's collapsed and unconscious. Is is it because of an airway obstruction? And hence the one of the focuses of of, of pediatric or you know you know life support in children, CPR in children, um, airway management and resuscitation in children. Um, you know it has a big focus on making sure that A and B. Um, other problems because generally the, the cardiovascular system is, is going to be is, is, is going to be much more pure it's less likely to be broken than an adult so it's much more likely to be a problem with a or b that's led to the collapse and unresponsiveness so anytime you know a child's found in a collapsed state um, choking um, and fully away obstruction should be on the, the your differential diagnosis so the other two different types and in, in broadly how, how to recognize them um, in terms of treatment um, the, the first thing, you know, it's it's like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the, the Galaxy, you know, the front page of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, those of you that um, you know, have read it, is um, don't panic, um, stay calm. And that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. But one of the things that, or that we have seen time and time again with all emergency situations, whether it's choking, whether it's a cardiac arrest, um, is that when people can, can stay calm and they can just, just sort of keep their head in the game and realise that, that they that by by not panicking and just trying to do a few simple things, they can actually make um, a potentially life saving difference. So the stay calm, don't panic is is the is one of the overarching most important things that that I can say, and and it's incredibly hard to do because often these are uh, your children, these are this is your husband, these are this is your mum, you know these are your family. So so not panicking and staying calm is incredibly difficult. But it's one of the most, it's one of the the, the the single things that if you can focus on just in the short term, not panicking and not losing it and just keeping it together, potentially your actions um, will be that much more effective um, in achieving the outcome that you, that you absolutely need. So um, try and stay calm, try not to panic. Um, the broad approach is the same um, if it's partial or complete. We'll talk about those um, in, a, in a second. Um, they obviously f end up flowing down slightly different algorithms, but the broad approach is the same. Um, call for help. 
um, early on. Call um, if you're there by yourself, um, you know, but there's people within shouting distance, you know, get them involved. Um, you know, many hands help, you know, get the, get anyone that's around to, to the scene. Make sure that if there are people around, that they understand that this is an emergency. This isn't just a kid playing a game or something silly. You know, so articulate to them that this is a real problem. Um, and call um, the ambulance service on um, on triple one, and the response you will get um, from the ambulance service to um, someone who is is choking um, or who's in cardiac arrest is what we call a purple response, which is everything that we have um, close by, um, and also the fire service. So um, you won't just get the ambulance service; you'll get the fire service responding as well. So um, it's really important if you can. To make the, the key point here to connect to communicate to um, the ambulance uh, the call takers when you call triple one is that this is a child or this is an adult who is not breathing and they are choking because that speeds up the the ambulance response um, by identifying that this is a person with who is in cardiac arrest or who has an airway problem um, so it's important to to call for help locally, so anyone who's in the you know who's immediately around you, get them involved, um, but also activate the emergency services via triple one. Um, now we come to the first the first decision point, the first question you have to ask yourself is, can you get the patient to cough? And this is largely patients who have partially away obstructions, um, and it depends on the the age of the patient, um, how you know in terms of their ability to. Um, to follow instructions and 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 to you know to actively to actively cough, um, but if if you can and they can, um, that's very reassuring. So um, if they can cough, that means that they are getting air around the obstruction in both directions, and the coughing also helps to clear the obstruction. So um, if they've got the a food bolus or a foreign body stuck at the top of their larynx and they're generating the pressure in their lungs to cough, that pressure wave when it comes up can be enough to knock the food bolus out of its location and have the airway cleared. So if they can cough, encourage them to cough, encourage them to cough violently. It's not, it doesn't, you know, we don't want a petite little cough. We want the biggest, most gut-wrenching cough that they're able to generate um, in the situation they're in. Obviously, you know, if, if it's almost a complete obstruction, the cough may be negligible, um, but if they can generate a good cough, encourage them to really cough. And if they become unconscious or they can no longer cough, at that point you treat it as if it's a full obstruction. So they can, this um, this is uh, just a sort of an algorithm, just sort of you know showing the the the, the, the flow, if you like, from um, you know where where you go um, once you've identified the airway obstruction. So can they cough? Um, we call it a mild airway obstruction or a partial airway obstruction and we just encourage them to cough. Um, but we've now moved over to the red. So these are the people that can't cough. They can't generate a decent cough. Um, if they're conscious, you wanna send for help. Um, you wanna give five back blows. If the back blows, and I'll come back to that in a second, just in terms of technique and things. Um, you wanna give five back blows. Um, if that's ineffective, you wanna give five chest thrusts and you wanna keep alternating between back blows and chest thrusts um, until either the obstruction clears or the patient becomes um, unconscious. Um, if the patient becomes unconscious, um, then we get them onto the floor and we start CPR. And we'll just go through each of those steps um, in turn now. So back blows, in terms of what is the back blow. So it's five sharp blows delivered with the flat of your hand between the shoulder blades. So it's, it's literally, uh, what we're aiming for is a sudden thrust. So we're trying to generate a pressure wave in the chest. So um, sort of a gentle tap won't do it. Um, we want to give a firm blow between the, the shoulder blades in the middle of the back. So bang, check for airway, check to see whether the obstruction's cleared. Bang, check to see whether the obstruction's cleared. Five of them in a row, and um, see if the you know see if we can clear the obstruction. How you position the patient for this? Um, the the diagram on the right um, shows some of the options. Um, obviously, um, with with children with an infant, um, we're utilising the benefit of gravity, and that we the, the child's held on your arm um, with head down. Um, to give you some, you know, as I say, the effect of gravity in terms of cleaning, the, clearing the obstruction, but it can be with the child sitting, can be over your knee, um, it can be an adult sitting in a chair. So um, broadly, the position is not overly important. It's just the what it's the what you're doing. It's the technique, which is the firm blow um, between the shoulder blades um, on the back. And you know, it's not a it's not a tap, and we don't want sustained pressure. It's a sudden jolt. 
because it's the jolt that generates the pressure um, that we want to try and expel the food bolus. So um, five back blows. After the back blows, um, we switch to um, chest thrusts. And our teaching on this is with an adult or larger child, wrapping your arms around the child um, with your one side of your fist, the thumb side of your fist um, against the breastbone, um, the midpoint of the breastbone, and you're giving five sudden jerks. And again, it's not like the CPR where you're doing the, the compression up and down. It's a thumping movement where you're trying to generate a pressure wave and um, you know use that pressure wave to move, move the airway obstruction. Um, now, we recommend that you um, pause between each one to check to see if the obstruction is cleared. So don't, don't just go, you know, um, chest thrust, chest thrust, chest thrust. So give a chest thrust, um, see if the obstruction is cleared, give another one, and you go through five. Um, if the obstruction is not cleared, then we and the patient is still awake, then we go back to back blows, um, and we just go round and round in circles until either the obstruction is cleared um, or um, the uh, the obstruction is cleared or the patient becomes unconscious. Now. Um, the, the, you know what's really important to stress here is this works. So this will clear most of the obstructions that um, that you know most of the choking. Um, sorry, will clear most of the foreign bodies that we see in in these patients. It's not perfect, and there will be patients that have a solid obstruction and they become unconscious and they require more definitive care. They require you to start CPR. They require the advanced life support skills that the paramedics bring to the scene. But the, the 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 important thing to understand is that these simple things work most of the time. Now, it's unlucky if you're in the group where it doesn't work, but this is worth doing because it works. So you can have someone with a complete airway obstruction and you can clear the airway obstruction with back blows and chest thrusts. And I think that's that's my main take home point is Often people don't do the, the, the simple things because they don't think they work. They will work, or they think that they're too complicated. These are simple and they do work, and it's really it's really important to, um, you know, if you're in this situation to to have a go. Now, our call takers and the communication centres will talk you through this over the phone. So if you've called for help, um, they will talk you through um, clearing, um, you know, attempting to clear a choking. Um, you know, a child or an adult who's choked. So, um, if this isn't something that you can carry, you carry around in your in your brain, and and you know, most a lot of people's brains are way too full to be stacking more stuff in. Um, our call takers will talk you through it. So that's the other important reason to call for the ambulance um, is that you know the call takers have the ability to actually provide what we call post dispatch instructions, which means after the ambulance is on its way to you, they will actually talk you through clearing a foreign body, they'll talk you through starting CPR. Um, and as, as I've already alluded to, um, with infants, um, it's important to take advantage um, of gravity. So with your back blows, having them down, um, you know, with the, the benefit of gravity. So again, supporting supporting um, their, their head and neck with your hand, um, lying face down on your arm, and then flipped over the other way um, for the chest thrust. So use gravity with infants. Um, do the Heimlich manoeuvre. So that's you know pretty much every uh, American TV show that has ever come to New Zealand shores, um, which has ever had uh, you know a, a vague medical uh, bent to it. Um, they've been doing the Heimlich manoeuvre left, right, and centre in the shows. So um, there's a big awareness um, in New Zealand and amongst the public around doing the Heimlich manoeuvre, and there's lots of people who who know how to do it, largely based on on watching TV. Um, and I think it's important to point out that it's never been recommended in Australia or New Zealand. It's largely been um, a North American thing, an American Canadian thing. Um, and there's evidence of significant harm, whether that's ruptured bowel, whether that's rupturing aorta, whether that's um, the you know the damaging the liver, damaging the spleen. Um, there's significant harm from doing the Heimlich manoeuvre, um, and there's no evidence at all that it's any better than back blows or chest thrusts. So um, if you if a foreign body is cleared with the Heimlich manoeuvre, it's just as likely that the same foreign body would have been cleared either with the chest thrusts or the back blows, um, and that's without the risk of rupturing someone's aorta. So um, you know more people. This this is this is a, you've got to be, I've got to be careful. I don't I sort of don't make semi hysterical statements, but um, there it, it's likely that there's been more people who have been hurt by the Heimlich manoeuvre than have actually been helped by the Heimlich manoeuvre. Um, again, got to be a little bit careful about what you say, but I, I think the, 
the overwhelming evidence is that the Heimlich manoeuvre does harm. So lots of people are familiar with it. Um, it's absolutely saturated, you know, on the TV screens, um, but it's not what we recommend. We recommend the back blows and the chest thrusts and all the evidence is that they're just as effective without doing the damage. Um, if they're unconscious, um, start CPR. So um, lie the patient on the floor um, and, uh, and, and start CPR. Um, check and remove any visible obstruction from the mouth. It may be that um, that all of the things that you've done has actually now cleared the obstruction, um, and you can you can flick it out with your finger. But we don't encourage you to poke blindly in the mouth. You can actually do more damage, and you can push the bo foreign body further down by blindly poking in the mouth. But if you can see it, it's absolutely reasonable to to remove it. Um, in terms of um, you know infant CPR. Um, you know, the, I won't sort of go through this line by line. That's just the, sort of the description of, of infant CPR in New Zealand. Um, it doesn't have to be done perfectly. People get really, really stressed and really, really panicky that um, that they will have been, that you know, that the, their fingers weren't in the, quite in the right spot. Um, they weren't quite pu pushing quite hard enough. Their rate was too slow. They were really tired and they couldn't keep the rate up. Um, something is better than nothing, okay, when it comes to, to C CPR. Um, and it's really important that if you possibly can, that you have a go at it. So the CPR makes a difference to um, people's outcome. So if you just move a little bit of <clears throat> blood around and you carry a little bit of oxygen to the brain, that potentially is buying enough time for the paramedics to arrive to clear the airway so that then they can get oxygen flowing in much more easily. So um, CPR is super important. Don't sweat the small stuff with it. Um, you're better off doing it than not doing it, even if you what you're doing is not perfect. Um, and that's the that's the thing that people say time and time again. You know, they they you know you talk to people um, at cardiac arrests where they've done CPR on on their family members, and they are just really really stressed and really really wound up about the fact that um, what if I didn't do it right? What if I made them worse? Um, you know, you, every little bit helps. And um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Obviously, that you know, there's a process we teach. You know, we teach CPR on first aid courses. You know, things we we offer something called three steps to life. I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we we teach CPR on these courses, um, and the the better you can do it, the better it is. But it doesn't have to be perfect. And please don't you know get really stressed and lose sleep over the fact that um, the CPR might not have been quite perfect because because some CPR is absolutely better than no CPR. Um, and again, in children, our approach in children is just slightly different because the body shapes change, they're bigger, um, just in terms of hand position and things like that. Um, and again, I won't go through in great detail looking at, you know, talking talking through the slide. Um, this is pretty standard to any first aid course, just to, to recap that, um, as, as, I, as I've been saying, that, you know, any CPR is better than no CPR. Um, prevention, um, fundamentally key here, you know, the prevention is, is, is better than the cure. Um, and obviously it's it's impossible to stop, um, to keep every small thing that a small child could put in their mouth out of their way. It's just impossible. Um, and we can do our best to make our homes as safe as we possibly can. Um, but, you know, the visitors come, they put something small down, gets in the mouth, gets what, you know, there's, you know, no matter what we do, um, you know, we can't make, our environments perfect. We should strive to make them as safe as we possibly can, um, but we also have to be realistic and, um, you know, we can't make them perfect. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, how you approach reducing the incidence of, of choking, um, if the, the kids less than a year, we recommend um, you follow the, the Plunkett Advice Ministry of Health Starship around um, when you introduce solid food and, um, you know, round food consistencies and, you know, the hardness and, you know, and um, you know, what, what foods, what ages. Um, you want to keep um, s small, interesting things out of sight um, if you possibly can, um, because it's, you know, if it looks interesting, if it's shiny, if it's a funny shape, if it's got a great texture, you know, as you all know, that's what kids love. Um, feeding under supervision is really important, including fluids. Um, it's, you know, there's a, there's a number, once the ki kids get old enough to sort of hold a bottle, uh, uh, you know, it, it's very easy and very tempting um, just to leave them to finish the bottle themselves. But, um, you know, that can lead to um, what's known as aspiration, which is, is not quite the same as choking, but it's where the fluid 
um, ends up in the wrong hole. So instead of going down the esophagus, um, we end up with fluid over the vocal cords. That can cause um, aspiration into the lungs, that can cause problems, um, but it can also cause a spasm of the vocal cords, something we call a ringer spasm, um, that can present in an identical manner to choking um, and you know can cause some similar problems. Um, in older children, um, you know, one of the, the key things for, for us, you know, if you if you had to say, you know, what what's one of the, you know, if you look back at all the pediatric, all the kids' chokings that, you know, that uh, Tehone St. John have been to um, over time, you know, what's a common theme? Um, unfortunately, the common theme is, um, is kids' parties or kids' gatherings. So, you know, any time you've got, you know, three, four, five-year-olds are really excited, they're not sitting down, they're running around, and they're trying to eat at the same time. Um, you know, that predisposes them, you know, to, to choking. That's a choking risk. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, it's it's striking a balance. Of, you know, lots, again, um, lots of people here will have, you know, had kids' parties and know the chaos that goes with having a children's birthday party um, and trying to get all of them sitting down all at once to eat is just next to impossible. But um, just be sensible in your food choices um, and just sort of encourage that, you know, if they are eating, you know, saveloys or sausages and things that, they're the sort of food where you really need to be sitting down and you need to be calm and you need to be supervised to eat. And running around completely distracted while eating a sausage is probably not um, a good thing from a, a you know a choking hazard point of view. Um, so supervised eating, bite-sized pieces, um, all really simple things, but um, they can potentially have a big impact on um, the incidence of choking. Um, do a first aid course if you can. Um, you know, the, 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 there's a variety of providers out there. I'm not, you know, I'm not here to sort of to sort of say, you know, come to St John, we'll do a first aid course for you. You know, um, it's but what I, what you know we offer them, and um, I think they're great, and I think they're well delivered. Um, but there's lots of providers that do. The key thing is to do a first aid course. It doesn't matter whether it's us, with Red Cross, whether it's other private provider private providers. Just do a first aid course if you possibly can. They're really important, not just choke choking not just cpr um hemorrhage control a whole lot of really simple things that can make the difference in an emergency so i'd absolutely encourage you if, if you haven't already done a first aid course to do a first aid course um one thing st john does offer um it, for, for free it's a free one hour course um which i think if uh, you know first aid courses cost money no matter who provides them so you know if the cost is a real consideration um for you think about getting in touch with us about what we call our three steps for life program um, we do it for schools we do it for faith faith groups we do it for Mirai, um, where um, you know our, a trainer will come along and they'll just basically take you through the very basic things you need to do um, in um, in, a, in a cardiac arrest or you know so someone who has is collapsed with with no cardiac output um, in terms of um, activating the triple one system understanding the basics of CPR and how to use an AED and um, you know, there's no charge to that, and that's something that we we offer for free. So, um, between a first aid course done by anyone, doesn't matter who does it, as long as as long as you do a first aid course or um, three steps to life, um, really, really useful things um, that you can do. Uh, so, just to sort of summarise, um, you know, prevention is um, better than a cure. Um, Recognise it, think about it, um, call for help early, um, both anyone that's immediately around, um, but also um, triple one importantly um if it's a partial obstruction encourage them to cough um if it's a complete obstruction it's just a cycle of back blows alternating with chest thrusts while they're conscious the point at which